right, good morning, everybody. I, I know we're on a tight schedule, so I think we'll go ahead here. If you're grabbing some coffee or whatnot, go ahead and do that. But we'll get started here. Um, my name is Gary Bergstrom. I'm a, a plant pathologist at Cornell University in New York State, and I've been working as an extension plant pathologist at field crops for about 38 years. Uh, don't pretend to be an organic crop specialist in any way, but I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of organic growers in my state and those transitioning from conventional into organic production. So I'm enjoying this conference to learn as much as uh, anything I might be imparting to you. Uh, so and I, I'd encourage, uh, I'm going to be around after this and uh, I hope to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with, with some of you who have some interest in this area. Of, of disease and mycotoxin management. So uh, I'm going to use this uh, hour, actually a little less than an hour together, uh, to try to come cover some basic things, get into some specific examples. But obviously, uh, I can't deliver a field crop pathology course in this amount of time. And uh, I'm sure you, d you wouldn't want it or expect it. But I'd like to point out um, a couple of resources that you might feel uh, are useful. First of all, Every one of the land-grant uh, institutions in the, in the uh, uh, north central area and the northeast, the rest of the country for that matter, have some really excellent uh, field crop plant pathology programs. And so I think you can, you can go to the plant pathology website in any of these states uh, uh, and, and get some very uh, excellent information. In addition, uh, there's a new enterprise that I've been privileged to be a part of, uh, a new website called the Plant Protection Network, and it's easy to find that, uh, just to Google that. And it has an excellent set of resources that are the combined activities of many extension plant pathologists across much of the United States. And there's fact sheets on most of the principal disease problems of corn, soybeans, small grains, etc. and we're building that uh, resource all the time. So I would recommend that to you. In addition, uh, I think one of the best investments that you could make if you're a corn and soybean grower is the APS uh, net or APS press. You can just Google APS press for a $30 investment for each of these. You can get a really uh, wonderful, uh, concise, uh, picture rich uh, manuals on, on corn diseases and soybean diseases in very uh, farmer friendly format. So I, I, I recommend those as as really excellent resources. So how do we spend our time together, our limited time together this morning? This is what I propose, uh, is that first we, I, I realize a lot of folks don't have exp extensive backgrounds in, in plant disease, so I want to talk to you about some of the basics of plant disease biology and epidemiology, that term meaning really how diseases develop in a population rather than just in an individual plant. Um, and talking about some of the uh, different types of control measures uh, that we can have to uh, diminish the risk of losses of quality and yield from plant disease. I want to put a, a, a special emphasis on talking about molds and mycotoxins, particularly in the uh, sense of uh, the problems we'd experienced across most of the northern tier states this year with ear molds on corn and also some in small grains. And then, time permitting, we'll get into uh, some very specific examples of kind of up-and-coming threatening diseases in our various commodity crops. Um, I also want to put it out there that uh, I'm not wedded to the slides that I brought. If there are things that are more pressing in your world that we should talk about, let's, uh, let's bring that out. So don't be, uh, don't be bashful, shout out questions and whatnot. But this is kind of our game plan for our time this morning. And first of all, uh, a lot of people you talk to don't, first of all, it's a surprise to many people in the general public that plants even get diseases. I think everybody in this room knows that they do. But we get the same spectrum of microorganisms causing diseases in plants, much like they do in humans. Uh, one th and these are generally microscopic organisms that you can't see uh, with the naked eye. Uh, our, uh, uh, Parasitic uh, roundworms or nematodes are at the border there. They're barely visible, but some of these are very tiny uh, objects. But uh, we'll talk about some of these. Um, at the top of that list, 
especially for field crop diseases, are fungal diseases. So I, I don't know, 80 plus percent of the losses of yield and quality due to plant diseases in the crops we work with are due to fungal diseases. And something that all fungi have in common is the need for free water, okay? So water is a big driver. These are why weather is such a, you know, rainfall, surface wetness, humidity. These are big drivers of fungal disease. And fungi reproduce by means of spores. And there's different biologies there, but basically it takes moisture to produce those spores, to disseminate those spores, and to cause infection of plants. Um, and, and I just gave some, some of the many uh, examples. There's another uh, class of plant pathogen that we used to think of as being fungi, but the oomycetes or water molds are actually not very closely related to fungi at all, but ecologically they behave much the same. Uh, the uh, water molds are actually much closer related to blue-green algae. And you'll recognize some of the names of these organisms, Pythium, Phytophthora. Uh, these are organisms that produce uh, spores with flagella. They are swimming spores. They move through, uh, particularly in the soil, they move through films of water. So again, this connection with environment with water. Um, we have some bacterial diseases that we're concerned about in, in field crops. Um, a number of uh, leaf blights in soybean, Stewart's wilt bacteria on corn. More recently, problems particularly in the upper Midwest with Goss's bacterial wilt and, and leaf blight on corn. And bacterial organisms uh, don't directly uh, enter uh, an unwounded cell, like on the epidermis of a plant. They need some kind of injury, or they need some kind of a vector, or in some cases they enter into natural, natural openings like hydathodes or, or the stomates under certain conditions. So something to keep in mind about bacterial diseases. Um, we do have some important virus diseases in, in these crops, and we'll just give a couple of examples here. Um, Viruses, uh, they can't reproduce on their own. They can only reproduce in a living uh, plant cell. And they can't get into that plant cell on their own. They either have to be uh, transmitted by a vector that wounds and introduces that plant, things like aphids can be nematodes sometime. They can also be seed borne or they can get in through a mechanical injury. So something to understand about some of our virus diseases. And I know there's already been some talk today about things like barley yellow dwarf virus. Uh, and lastly, uh, nematode, the parasitic roundworms. Uh, these, again, are favored by movement through films of water in the soil to infect uh, into the roots. And the, the most notable example is soybean cyst nematode that we, if we have time, may say a little bit about. So... Um, I really enjoyed the very opening talk this morning about how understanding the, the dynamics and biology of soil, of, of the rumen of cattle, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that there's very much the same thing when you talk about plant diseases. Uh, you really have to understand the life cycle of these microorganisms that cause the disease. Um, and we've already explained a little bit about the different causal agents and how they react to plants a little differently. Um, I think we're kind of sitting at the precipice of a great revolution in, in plant disease understanding as we look at the microbiomes and understanding how the, the bad organisms interact with the good organisms. And we're just at the infancy of understanding that, both in the, in the soil environment but also within the plant. Uh, and there's just, I think this would be a very hopeful thing for organic farming in the future as we learn more about this. Just like humans, as you know, we have more... Uh, my, microbe cells in our body than we have human cells, plants have endophytic organisms living in their roots, in their leaves, in their vascular system, along, uh, along with uh, plant cells. And that balance between the good guys and the bad guys is going to play out, and we need to understand more about that. So some of the very essential things that we need to know before we can manage a plant disease is to understand it, the, the life cycle of these pathogens. So 
how does it reproduce? Uh, for instance, we, we said that the fungal pathogens reproduce by spores. Um, we're going to talk a lot about rotational sequence as a, as a strategy. Um, we have very narrow host range pathogens. For instance, powdery mildew on barley, on wheat, on different cereals, those are all very highly specific pathogens. They don't go from one crop to the other. Um, on the other hand, we have organisms like, uh, like pythium, uh, like some of the soil-borne diseases, have very wide host range. So we need to think about this when we're planning rotations. In general, we want, uh, we want the more distantly related plants in rotational sequence because they have, tend to have more specialized pathogens that don't pass along to the next crop. So we can break some of those pest cycles. How does a pathogen survive from one growing season to the next? Does it, does it hang out in debris of the previous crops? And how long, or does it just survive freely in the soil? These are very important matters. Uh, how does the pathogen spread? How do the spores of a fungus spread? Uh, do they just spread very locally within an indiv individual field? When we talk about some of the uh, spores of things like uh, powdery mildews and of rust fungi, they have, to, they have to overwinter on a living plant somewhere. And then they can be dispersed literally in air currents over a continent. And we'll also talk about some other diseases. Let's take, for example, eye spot disease on corn. It really, it's a specific pathogen of corn. It has no windborne stage. It has to hang out in corn debris in a field where corn is going to reoccur uh, in that field or maybe an adjacent field. So, the way you manage those diseases is totally different. Um, we've already mentioned some of these have a relationship with a vector, some of the virus diseases and whatnot have to be spread by an insect or some other organism. And, and then top of the list is what is the favorable environment for a particular plant disease? Um, and I'm just going to pull out an example of wheat as, as an example here. So. Uh, you know, in the eastern and north central United States here, we don't have nearly the problem with soil-borne diseases on wheat that they have in places like North Dakota or Washington State or some other places because we don't grow wheat after wheat after wheat, okay, or even uh, generally every two years. So uh, a lot of those pathogens don't build up like they do other places. So wheat in rotation with, with legumes, vegetable crops, minimum disease potential. And the tremendous diversity in organic farming is helpful on this. Um, we've often counseled don't plant wheat after corn because of the tremendous reservoir of fusarium fungus that's the producer of vomitoxin. Um, on, uh, you know, it may not be a big risk for things like rust or mildew to plant wheat after wheat, but there's a lot of good reason not to do that. All right, how do these pathogens disseminate? Uh, they move around. You can introduce a, an individual infected plant, but how does it spread? So water plays a big role in this, uh, and, and so do insects and even human activity. Animals can move things to some degree, and including the human animal. Machinery is a good way to move around things, like some of the soil-borne viruses that we've dealt with are very clearly moved when we move far, farm equipment from one location to another. Um, the kind of holy grail of plant pathology is to talk about a uh, plant disease triangle, and I'd, I'd expand that to a plant disease pyramid, which gives the additional dimension of time. But basically, the three legs of this, uh, three sides of this triangle, it takes a susceptible population of a species and variety of plant, it takes a virulent population of the pathogen, and it takes that favorable environment. And those things have to come together for a significant period of time to have what we would, we would term an epidemic, okay? So, uh, you know, a lot of diseases are episodic in their nature. And why is that? It, it's because any of those three legs. Sometimes, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, weather that's not favorable. We can go a couple of years before seeing significant diseases, some of these diseases. Uh, in some cases, uh, we have had a uh, variety of, let's say, a small grain cereal that's, that's highly resistant to rust until the rust population evolves to overcome those resistance genes. Um, so it's a highly dynamic system. 
And just because we don't see a disease in our field this year or for two, three years, it can suddenly develop when these kind of perfect storm conditions come together. Um, let's talk about some of the general kind of tools in the tool chest for controlling diseases. And uh, cultural practice for organic growers, in fact, for conventional growers, is, is the most prominent uh, tool in our toolkit. And crop rotation sequence is the most obvious one, but I'll go through some other examples as well. Um, I heard the previous talk, and it was very interesting. Uh, we put a lot of store in having varieties that are resistant to diseases, but I realize it's a luxury that we don't have resistance to a lot of the problems and in all the maturity groups and all the adaptation areas. So that would be an ideal, that we could control most things by selection of varieties. But we're not there or even close to there. Um, there's a lot of exciting work going on in biological control with things like microbial pesticides, things with uh, bacillus bacteria, with trichodermic uh, fungi, different things like that. Um, we've got a long way to go to understand and, and manipulate some of those um, uh, to a greater extent. Likewise, there are OMRI-approved chemical treatments, coppers, sulfurs, all kinds of different things uh, that have some utility, and to what extent we're employing them is, is, is a question. Occasionally, uh, regulatory controls, quarantines, uh, but also we should put in that bucket uh, seed certification programs can be extremely important for, uh, you know, controlling the risk of some of our uh, seed-borne diseases. So just expand on the topic of cultural methods, which is probably the most rich tool set that you would have in the organic community. Uh, it's been said a couple of times, I've heard today already, that our rich species diversity and sequence of various species is, is a tremendous advantage. So the, the, the more unrelated botanically that we rotate crops, we're also diminishing the exposure and buildup of pathogens that tend in general to be the closer the crop is related, there's a general tendency the closer the pathogens that go with that crop are going to be related. Tillage can be an important uh, mechanism when we need to for things that just build up and survive between se uh, seasons in, in the uh, debris. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of picking the right field to grow, to grow the right crop. If you have problems like Phytophthora root rot, for instance, you need to have a well-drained uh, soil. And uh, soil, investing in soil uh, drainage can be maybe one of the best things you can do. We can see problem, I know, for conventional growers where we have un unbalanced nutrition, especially excessive nitrogen uh, relative to, to potassium and other nutrients. Um, a generalization, if we can grow a healthy plant, even if we have plant uh, pathogens in the environment, it's more likely to yield well and have less degradation of quality, even in the presence of some of these microbes. Um, planting and harvesting dates can be very important. For, for some of these things that in a region, the inoculum has to build up through several past reproductive cycles during a season, if we get our crops in early, it's not that they're resistant, but they, may, they, they can employ a, an avoidance strategy before the, the big populations of pathogens get built up. Maybe we get the crop past its vulnerable life stages. Sanitation can be very important. Um, in the early days in my position, one of the most threatening plant diseases, and this was true in Wisconsin as well, was verticillium wilt on alfalfa before we had resistance to that in alfalfa varieties. And I could see exactly where folks had moved uh, from harvesting a highly infective older field into a younger field, it was a pattern just like you were cleaning off a paintbrush where the entrance to the field had a lot of symptoms as you went through, kind of looked diluted out. So for some of these diseases, cleaning the equipment and leaving uh, our infested fields to be harvested last is a good strategy. And any kind of stress reduction in the crop. So there's other things that cause stress, uh, weed, weed competition, insects, can also contribute to problems with plant disease. So I'd like to take a few minutes now to talk about what I know is a lot of people's minds after this past growing season, and this was true in the Northeast as well as 
uh, the northern tier of uh, Midwestern states, tremendous problems in corn, with um, uh, specifically with, with ear molds, and in some cases with mycotoxins. Um, my first point here is that a lot of the molds we saw brought on by the excessive uh, continued moist period through late summer and fall, not all of these molds are producers of toxins. They may not be desirable for quality of, of the grain, but they are, not, they are not a danger to humans or livestock. So, for instance, one of the most common molds we see is this char charcoal-colored rot called Cladosporium ear mold, not a mycotoxin producer. Uh, Diplodia or Stenocarpella uh, leaf or uh, ear rot is becoming more common, and it's kind of this whitish uh, mold on the ears. Again, at least in North America, we've not seen any toxins associated with that. So just because we see a uh, mold doesn't mean that we're going to have high levels of toxins. Another one that I've seen quite prevalent in my area is trichoderma ear rot, this kind of uh, bright bluish green cover color. I've seen that in particularly with ears damaged by, uh, by birds, allowing entrance of, uh, uh, of the molds into the ear. So what are mycotoxins? These are, these are, are small molecular uh, substances, natural products. They're produced by the filamentous uh, microscopic fungi. Uh, from a standpoint of the fungus, they are secondary metabolites. They're not necessarily produced all the times that the molds are growing, but particularly when they're under stress. And they're called mycotoxins because they're a toxin to vertebrate animals. And uh, mycotoxins are produced by some strains of certain species of fungus, and then not all the time under certain conditions. And, you know, they are so universal uh, that we find it in so many of our foodstuffs and whatever, but you've all heard that the, uh, the dose makes the poison, and that's the case here. They are problematic when they occur at some level of concern. One of the challenges is that we're now able to uh, uh, chemically detect these substances at parts per billion or lower, and we don't know a lot in many cases about what they do to animals or human even at, you know, even at higher levels. So there, there's a, a little catch-up that's needed in our understanding here. So I talk about the big three mycotoxin-producing fungal, fungal uh, genera here. Fusarium, which has been the pr principal uh, genus of problem in our part of the world here. Uh, also Aspergillus, which is a bigger problem in some of the warmer production areas. And Penicillium, which I think might be an underrated problem in our area. So here we come to these levels of concern. So deoxynevolanol or vomit toxin we'll talk quite a bit about. That's been the principal toxin problem we've had in grain crops in the northern tier of states. And as little as one or two parts per million can cause problems, digestive problems for uh, swine, dogs, cats, basic, humans, basically any animal with simple stomach. Ruminant animals, poultry tolerate considerably higher. Um, Xerelinone is a female hormone, an estrogen, that can cause reproductive problems, particularly in swine. Uh, Fumonacin is a very potent uh, cancer-causing agent, and particularly in species like horses, um, at, at five to ten parts per million feeding, uh, especially corn screenings to horses, can result in a disease called leucoencephalomalacia. It's a horrendous thing actually rots out the horse's brain. It's a, it's a horrific thing to see. So these are not things we would like to be building up in our system. So I, won't, I, I don't have time to go much into the chemical detection, but there are both uh, quick tests, things like uh, serology, ELISA-based tests, you know, strip tests where you can grind up a sample and compare it, color change against some standards but there are also more expensive types of chromatography. Um, and I think both have their uses, particularly in sending things to market where you have very strict guidelines. Sometimes it's worth having the more expensive chemical tests done. Um, and it's not just the technology for testing. Very often the challenge is what is a representative sample. I think we've all heard the story or maybe have the own experience that you're taking your grain to a mill, 
it's rejected, the driver goes, has a cup of coffee, comes back, it passes the next time around. Sampling is a huge thing, and I'm told that if you're doing a, a probe sample in a, in a tractor trailer, it takes probably a minimum of 10 probes uh, to, to really get an accurate picture. The gold standard is to use a tailgate sample where you're, you're taking off the whole flow of unloading of that uh, grain. So I want to share a couple things I found of interest. A uh, colleague of mine with uh, Alltech Corporation shared these results with me. They're testing, they look at 27 different toxins. And this is New York-centric data, excuse me for that, but this year we had problems like Wisconsin and other places. And, and what's interesting to me, it's not just vomitoxin, D-O-N. We are seeing humanocins at levels that I wouldn't have guessed was there in our grain. We're seeing a lot of these secondary toxins generally at low levels. But one of the problems with this field is there's not a lot of good data on the interactive nature of some of these toxins when there's several together. Um, this is corn silage, so it's not just a matter of grain. But we were finding high DOM levels in a number of our corn silage samples. And look at how many other bars for all these other. I would have said that in the, my past experience, we'd have no aflatoxin in our corn in New York State. We don't have a lot, but we do have detectable aflatoxin. We have a number of these odd toxins produced by uh, penicillium species, at least at, at low levels in our corn silage. So, Probably most people's knowledge of mycotoxins uh, is often equated with aflatoxin, which is a particular me metabolite of Aspergillus flavus. We generally have not had a lot of uh, problem with that mold in the northern tier because it generally doesn't get warm enough. This is favored by warm, droughty kind of conditions. Well, some years we get something close to that. And this is producer of aflatoxins. And just to remind folks, this is one of the most part uh, potent carcinogens there is. Look at, it, at what the dose in grams uh, for feeding rats, in this case, uh, what dose causes tumors in 50% of the rats in study. And we think of some nasty things here like benzene and, and other things. Well, look at how, how little it takes to cause tumors uh, with aflatoxin. So we do have an FDA standard for milk. In particular, we cannot exceed um, 20 parts per billion. The other thing I point out that the problem with uh, toxins is we talk about parts per million for most of the toxins and parts per billion for things like aflatoxin. Well, I think the public has a problem with that because all they hear is part, okay? So uh, uh, a part per billion is one one thousandth of a part per million, okay? So amount matters tremendously. We see some penicillium ear rot, and we see some penicillium, this bluish, greenish mold, develop in uh, some of our silage as well. And there's just a whole long uh, list of secondary metabolites that are produced. Some of the more uh, uh, well-known ones, things like okra toxin and patulin. Patulin's a problem in things like apple juice and whatnot. Uh, but then there's weird things like roquefortine and a lot of these minor toxins, but we're seeing more of it in our corn silage, and yet we don't really know what it's doing uh, to uh, animal performance. Uh, fusarium ear rot, and by this I mean for, uh, primarily fusarium verticilloides, um, is not so obvious in, uh, in the uh, corn ears. Uh, one of the prominent things it shows, I don't know if you can see here, what I call this starburst pattern on the kernels is very typical of infection. Uh, by this organism, and this is the producer of fumonacin. And, and before the last year, I saw just very tiny amounts of fumonacin in our, in our corn. But we've been seeing one, two part per million occasionally, and that getting close to levels of concern. Gibberella ear rot, or Fusarium graminiarum, that's the big problem in grain production in the northern tier particularly. The, the Latin name for this fungus really means Fusarium graminiarum of the grasses. It has a tremendous host range, basically for any grass, cereal, grain, plus it can occur on soybean roots, on a lot of other things. But basically, it's, it's a disease, an organism on the grasses, and particularly on corn stubble, just produces, you know, literally billions of spores on overwintered corn stubble. And these are the symptoms, this typical uh, kind of pip, 
pink ear rot from the tip back. Primary infection through the silk channel when uh, the biggest risk factor is when we have continuous wetness when the silks are emerging. That's the big number one risk factor there. Um, I won't spend much time on this, but we talk about DNA, DON, but there are related chemicals, nivolinols, closely related, these three acetyl and 15 acetyl DONs. Uh, they also show up in lower quantities, and a lot of our quick tests only test for DON, but there are related compounds that, continue, that contribute to the, to the uh, toxicity here. Uh, again, this is kind of New York-centric, but in this last year, our ethanol plants, for instance, were rejecting corn at three parts per million and discounting at two parts per million. And, uh, and yet, coming off of farms, we had things exceeding five, ten, even a dozen parts per million sometimes. And I understand in this area that was true as well. Um, at the same time, if I look at corn coming off different fields, it was a mosaic of badly infested corn, almost clean corn, and so we're trying to learn some things from that. The other thing I want to point out for silage producers, there are a lot of people surprised that say, I didn't see any mold in my corn. How come I got Don results back on my silage? It, in this case of silage, it's the fusarium infection not only in the ears, but also in the, in the stalks, the, the fusarium gibberella stalk rot can result in, uh, in Don bloating coming from that component of the silage as well as from the ears. So a, a, a colleague of mine, Albert Tenuta in Ontario, that they had incredible problems, particularly southwestern Ontario this year, looked, they had a very thorough survey and by far not a surprise, the number one factor was the weather the coincidence of uh, wet weather with the silk emergence and the continuing wet weather condition, delayed harvest through the fall. Um, hybrid susceptibility was a close second. And they have actual data here. I have anecdotes from my own state, but um, it, it does appear when I look at some of those tests that some of the really widely grown commercial hybrids happen to be just a little more susceptible than a lot of other things, and that accounts for a lot of what's coming in. Uh, and then all kinds of other factors, damaging to the kernels, the, the lack of cleaning, how it was processed and handled. Um, but this is an illustration from uh, Ontario, where if you look at, this is along the x-axis, the uh, contamination with Don, and these are just a uh, number of corn uh, hybrids here, and some generally had a lot lower than others. All right, so how do we reduce the risk? Um, timely planting of adapted, and by adapted, primarily the right maturity group, but with partial resistance. To what extent this is available in some of the hybrids you can choose from, I don't honestly know, but it's, it's a goal to move toward. Uh, we've already heard that uh, <clears throat> you can build up uh, a lot of inoculum by growing uh, corn after corn, um, but, uh, well, I'll, I'll deal with this in a few minutes, that even if you're clean plowed ground first year corn or first year wheat, you still have a potential for serious disease because of the spores in the area, in the, in the uh, air. Um, again, whatever you can do to avoid stress on, or diminish stress on the crop, you'll be in a better position. So I've had the privilege to work for a number of years in actually screening some pre-commercial hybrids for gibberella ear rot and lowered vomitoxin content, and those genetics are out there. There are, there are ears, as you can see there, the very susceptible varieties in the middle of the picture here, and you can see some have made a very much slowed down production of the fungus and production of mycotoxins. So, I think one of the things as consumers when talking with our seed suppliers, if we're concerned about toxins, we need to really kind of push that envelope and say this is, this is a trait we need. We need lowered mycotoxin potential. Um, so the other thing to know about these molds is that, first of all, uh, they only develop when there's a, a certain level of moisture in the kernels. So if we can dry our dry corn or small grains down, you know, 12, 13 percent, Whatever comes in the door after harvest is still there, but it won't develop more in storage, okay? 
They're also strictly aerobic organisms. So if we get proper silage conditions, we, we can store it in the freedom of, of, uh, of air, of oxygen. Uh, you will stop further growth of the fungus and production of, of toxins. Okay, just to make a little jump here, we're talking about exactly the same fungus, Fusarium graminearum, that causes our head blights in small grain cereals, and a very similar situation. We were talking about moisture on the corn silks as being the critical factor. Now we're talking about uh, moisture on the, on the flowering small grains. Okay, so when you have that perfect storm of, of conditions, got spores in the air, we have uh, uh, the uh, conditions for infection, you can get serious fusarium head blight in wheat, barley, all of our small grain cereals. Some of the strategies we use there are, are, are comparable. We've made great strides in, in uh, soft red winter wheats, particularly of getting moderate levels, partial resistance to fusarium head blight. Um, use, sowing your different fields with different varieties and planting them on different dates is kind of a, it's not really a resistance, it's, a, it's an insurance policy because it's the, it's the overlap of that perfect weather conditions with the, with the uh, flowering. So if we, if we have fields coming into flower on different dates and some coincide and some don't with that favorable weather, uh, we can kind of spread a risk out on a farm. Um, there, there are regional risk predict predictions that I'll talk about. Um, obviously, we don't have uh, chemical fungicides, synthetic fungicides, which are a very big part of the game now for uh, uh, conventional producers. I have been looking for a number of years at some of the microbial products, some of the coppers and different things. I've not found anything in, at this point, and I just say at this point, that comes anywhere close to the control we get with, uh, with, from any of the OMRI approved materials. But that's, that's something that's out there. Um, one of the best things we can tell farmers to do is turn up those combine fans. If you've done some pre-screening and see you've got a, a mycotoxin potential, leave those shriveled kernels on the ground. And also invest in, in extra cleaning on that grain. All right, one of the things I hear a lot is like, well, we get 20 degrees below zero, so we don't have any talk, we don't have any uh, fungal problems, right? Well, when you, when you, how, with, if you uh, leave your food out on the table versus put it in the freezer, which one's gonna last longer, okay? So it's the same thing here, it's kind of ironic, but actually our cold temperatures kind of preserve our, our, our residues and, and the fungi that are preserved in them. So uh, our, our winters aren't doing us any great uh, uh, favor in that particular regard. Um, so this is one of the reasons that we look at, at tillage to incorporate some of that de de debris at, as, uh, as a measure sometimes where it's really warranted. I want to, you know, I hear a lot that, well, the, the problem is growing grain after grain. Well, that's part of the problem, um, but I've done some work for, 20 some years on the aerobiology of this fungus. And one of the more interesting things we did, we, uh, we, we flew even over bodies of water with these remote controlled airplanes and we caught spores kilometers, miles away from any source of residue on the ground. During the season, the fusarium fungus is kind of everywhere in our humid production climates, particularly when we're growing small grains in, in basically an ocean background of corn. So, if we look at the various tools available, obviously we don't have the fungicides uh, for an organic producer, but we have to be putting more emphasis on, on resistance in the cultivars. And these cultural practices like for, uh, rotation sequence are still very important, but realize that it won't get all the job done. Uh, if people are interested in signing up for regional alerts on your cell phone uh, during the season, you can just Google SCAB USA org and sign up for those. Uh, uh, if you sign up for the, uh, for instance, the Northern Soft Winter Wheat, you will get uh, commentary from folks like myself in New York, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Vermont, for example. Um, I'm a little concerned that with the time, what I propose to do is go through some examples of, I think, kind of threatening diseases in small grain cereals, a little bit in corn soybeans, other things you're interested, but I'm gonna break right for a minute to see, 
to make sure we have time to talk about some things that you're particularly interested in. So make sure we cover some of that. Anybody want to shout out there something they really would like to know about disease management in some particular crop system? Yes. Good. Okay. So forge ahead on that or, uh, okay. All right. Okay. Glad to do so. And, yeah, please. I have a question. So just out of curiosity, all the slides and data you're showing yeah. is, that's conventional ground though, right? Or is that all organic? No, I ground? think the biology really is not, does not matter. The biology of these disease organisms, uh, I mean, that, uh, the, the, the methods that we have at our disposal to control them, that varies. But it only varies Correct. in the but sense. The, but yeah. the, like the rates of, say, increase. So I work in conventional and organic sure. agriculture. And yeah. so I'm curious if you've been able to see that when it's increasing, say, in conventional, is it also increasing in organic production systems? Because certain things that are happening in conventional, yeah. with spraying certain things, with using certain chemicals, sure. are, is that increasing the, my, the mycotoxins? And so I just, everything yeah. that you're presenting, yes, yeah. culturally and, and morphology, yes, that goes across yeah. everything. You are but absolutely right. Yeah. It, it is so complicated, uh, uh, and in many cases, different varieties, different. So I've had, there are so many complicating factors. In general terms, I don't see a tremendous difference in mycotoxin potential between conventional organic but just what you can do about it. Now, I think the, one of the big advantages that I did touch on is, is the crop diversity in a lot of organic. That's, that's a great help. That, that really is. Um, but a lot of it ends up being so anecdotal that it's, that it's hard to really draw very strong conclusions about that. I really appreciate the question. I don't have a, a dogmatic answer for that. Love to see the side-by-side -side studies to be able to compare yeah. a conventional system, say yeah. mycotoxin levels versus in our organic farming rotation systems, and yeah. are we actually decreasing our levels based on our better, uh, healthier soil biology? Yada yada yada. Right. So, yeah. just a fascinating question that I would love research on. Uh, sounds good to me. <laughs> I would like that too. Uh, and there's so, so, for instance, in the conventional world. Uh, there are, there are actually, uh, like the, the strobirulin fungicides, actually have a tendency to increase the mycotoxin levels. Triazole fungicides lower it. Uh, you know, so there's, there, there are interactions every way you can point arrows, okay? So it's, it's very, but your point's well taken. Uh, we've been involved in, uh, in a study at uh, Cornell uh, for transitions or uh, conventional grain into organic uh, production with various rotations. And uh, we were trying to get at some of those things. Now, the reality was that uh, all of our crops were pretty darn healthy during those four years that we did it because we didn't want to introduce anything. We wanted to, and, and so there wasn't a tremendous difference in, in disease, but we didn't have really serious disease during the years of those studies, but we did very direct comparisons and whatnot in that case. But again, uh, Mother Nature is uh, tricky about, you know, where, where disease intensity occurs. So it's a, it's a long-term proposition, but really good point. Sir. We, uh, we had some uh, uh, tar, tar spot yes. this year. Yes. And, uh, we also had a gray leaf. Yes. And they, they both uh, came together. And uh, they were, we had some different, we had some, uh, the older corn uh, that was pretty mature, you know, was getting ready for chopping. Right. Uh, we still utilized real good. The corn that we had planted later, uh, and it was early maturing corn, got hit the hardest. Uh, yep. It uh, it was almost like a, a frost, and then we we uh, went because we got different farms in different areas in Iowa, Lafayette, and Grant County there, and we went to a, a farm that was uh, about ten miles away, and we didn't have it. Right. So it, it was it was quite a a significant thing that we've never seen and we've never had. Yep. 
I'll I have a couple of slides in there. We'll see if I get to it. But yeah. I, how many people have experienced tar spot, in the la uh, particularly Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, this area? And it, it just came out of nowhere. Yeah. This is basically a tropical corn disease in the Central America, South American highland tropics. And uh, it, uh, it just, how it arrived in Indiana in 2015, nobody really knows. Whether it was a hurricane, something took a long ride, or some infested seed, we, we really don't know. But it seems to be staying here now, surviving our winters, uh, multiplying. Uh, there's been some good work done in Illinois and some other places on looking at hybrids for susceptibility to tire spot, a fungal, fungal disease. And there are, there are considerable dis uh, differences in hybrid reaction, but nothing strongly resistant so far. So, yes, that's one that I had in that category of a kind of emerging diseases. Um, since the point was brought up about leaf blights on corn, and that's where our biggest losses of yield have been with the leaf blights, and they don't occur every year. Northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot being the most widespread, but we have eye spot, we have northern leaf spot, we have another other uh, number of other uh, fungal leaf blights. Really, the answer there, besides crop rotation, is um, is partially resistant varieties. And for so long, uh, in conventional uh, agriculture, the seed companies have looked at at varieties that are uh, hybrids that are highly highly resistant. I think we're, what we're down to now is, is, is uh, really looking at partial resistance. So a lot of the companies have, depending on the company, a one to nine scale or a nine to one scale. I've kind of found in working with our growers, if we're at the midpoint toward resistance of those quantitative scales, uh, we do pretty well with sustainable management as far as preventing massive losses from leaf blights. And, of course, to point out, look at these complicated tables, gray leaf spot or leaf blight, all these things. You could be quite resistant to one thing and quite and susceptible to another. So I know there's an effort to get quantitative trait loci that would be general leaf blight resistance, and there have been some progress made in that way. But uh, still, the backbone of, of corn leaf blight control is rotational sequence with variety selection. Uh, just very quickly, uh, just to say a few things about the small grain cereals, one of the challenges that I do see with organic production is with the, uh, the embryo-born uh, smut fungi, in particular loose smut, where um, I, I have seen some of the OMRI-approved materials being having some efficacy against the externally-born smut fungi, things like common bunt. But this is actually the infected seed. The fungus resides in the embryo. So in conventional agriculture, we've been very successful with, um, you know, uh, penetrant uh, fungicides, things that the chemicals actually get into the embryo of the seed. So this is, this is kind of one hole in that program. And I think what it means is that we have to put more emphasis on, on sort of the seed lineage, make sure that through the seed production cycles that we start with clean seed. Uh, you know, uh, looking at through the different seed production generations that we don't, uh, we don't have a buildup of, of these embryo-born smuts. Um, mildew uh, can be a problem. Again, I think that, uh, that selecting varieties, we can get some pretty good resistance to mildew. Um, rust, the same thing, a lot of difference amongst varieties. And, of course, things like the rust and the mildew, they have races. And over time, what, what looked resistant one period of time, the fungus populations overcome that resistance. Um, some of the uh, foliar uh, leaf blotches uh, caused primarily by fungi. Um, ag again, uh, I think primarily we're looking at rotation. Um, if we're rotating with legumes, vegetables, whatever, uh, we're not going to have as much problem. You don't want to have wheat after wheat. And again, I think there are some things we could do to clean up our seed generations there. Uh, one that's come up in the last uh, several years that was not a, much of a problem before in this area is stripe rust. And um, it's been really expanding its range. And I think there's some increased virulence, uh, the, the races, the types, uh, that, are, that are moving up from their overwintering areas in the, in the Mid-South and the, and the Deep South. Um, so I think this is a matter 
where we have to look at varieties again. And one thing that concerns me is that some of the, there's at least a trend, I don't know if it's causal, but there's at least a trend. Some of the, some of the things that are looking toward more resistance to things like fusarium head blight are tending to show then more susceptibility to things like stripe rust. So we have to look at our, uh, our variety selection in a you know, kind of composite way. And I'm just showing here that this, again, is kind of New York-centric. Some of our most widely grown uh, white and, and red winter wheats are the ones that are showing the most of this. And that's an evolution toward uh, selecting uh, uh, fusarium-resistant plants. We have to watch out that some, something else doesn't sneak up in the meantime. Uh, let me just go through a few things quickly here. Uh, stock rots on corn are, are still very important. Uh, there's very little actual resistance to Fusarium gibberella stock rotting corn. What there really is is stiff stock varieties, ones that are really plant architecture, that they may be even uh, diseased on the inside, but they tend to stand up. Um, Anthracnose stock rot has been building in our area at least, and there are some pretty good resistance genes out there. To what extent they're in hybrids that you might get for organic, I don't know. Here's the tar spot you were talking about, and it looks like that greasy tar spot on the leaves. There's so little that we know about this yet, but this shows that this was the known distribution this last year. And that started from 2015 with a very small area in Indiana and Illinois. So it's, it's blossoming, it's sticking around, it's surviving our climate. And uh, this phylacra species, uh, uh, genera that causes this, uh, we don't know if the host range of this one is, is, is restricted to corn or maybe it goes to some of other, other weedy grasses. That's something we really need to figure out in a hurry. But this is some, some projections about where it's likely to take hold as a serious problem based on what we already know about the, the weather conditions that favor it. And that's kind of a frightening map there. Uh, this, this could be a, a growing problem for us. And uh, tremendous, uh, this, these are some slides from my, uh, my, my colleague Nathan uh, Kleszewski at the University of Illinois. And I don't know if you can see in the background there some very brown looking corn that's all but destroyed by this. And so there's quite a different and hybrid reaction. Yet, even at the left hand, uh, hand scale, even the, the more resistant, I don't know if I'd really call resistant, there's some less susceptible at this point. So I'm not going to say much of soybean cyst nematode. Uh, I heard in one of the other presentations that you don't have as much concern about it in organic production, but yet it can be a problem. What I will refer you to is the soybean cyst nematode coalition that has extensive resources and information about that. One of the principal things to know about that is that almost all the resistant varieties in the marketplace have the single uh, gene source of resistant from plant introduction uh, 88788, and that resistance is becoming quickly defeated in the United States by, by new variants of the nematode that can overcome that. One of the exciting things you might key in on for organic production is there are, are microbial uh, seed and soil treatments like the Caliva product uh, biological from Syngenta that actually operate to lower the population um, of the bacteria, of the uh, nematode in the soil. Um, white mold continues to be one of, I think, the biggest threat in the northern tier in soybean production. I have a colleague um, at, at Cornell who does a lot of, Sir Pethy Bridge, who's doing a lot of work on this. And I just might throw out there that uh, she is finding some promise in some of the new bacillus treatments, uh, double nickel and some other products that look like they are having some impact on, on decreasing the, uh, the survival of, uh, of sclerotia in the soil. So I'm going to end it there. I think we're, we've just got a couple of minutes. And uh, yeah, please. Um, I, I think you're going to be talking about fertilizer. Yes, just for lack of time. But yes, that's a, that's a concern. And as a matter of fact, this last growing season through a very broad sweep of states, it's, incre it's increasing as a problem in wheat, which kind of surprised me. And one of the things I ran into uh, 
this year with looking at some of our corn silage, I was, I was mystified at first at why are ergot alkaloids showing up in mycotoxin tests of our corn silage. And I think some of it is, is some of our just background grassy weeds are getting ergot some, and they're being, they're being combined in there. And so I think there's some broad concern about the increase in, in ergot. Uh, if you heard uh, the previous presentation on, on seed, talked about that some of the hybrid rise are less likely to, because of just the flowering mechanism, less, less likely to be contaminated with, with ergot. But ergot, I think, is a growing problem. Again, anecdotally, one of the things I've been seeing in the Northeast is that uh, cereals that are following any kind of a fallow or meadow situation with a lot of grasses, fescues, other things, are having a little more problem with, uh, with ergot. So I think we have to be concerned not only in the, in the actual rotation of, of harvested crops, but what cover crops we have coming along and other things like that that are preceding our, our cereal planting. So um, I'm concerned about that as well. Uh, I've been seeing a fair amount, of, I do a lot of work now with malting barley, and I've seen a fair amount of it in our malting barley. The only thing I can say there is we've been pretty successful in cleaning that grain and getting rid of the ergot in that, in that particular case. But Yeah, so the, 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 uh, the sclerotia, the, the, the heart looks like a little rodent dropping there. It's, very, it's, it's a different thing than, than white mold, but very similar type of survival structure. That, that'll, that'll persist in the soil for some time. Um, and then that can yield inoculum, spore inoculum in another season. That's correct. There, there, there is, it's kind of almost like a weed situation where you have a seed bank. It, it's somewhat similar concept there. Uh, you can, but not overnight. It'd probably take a few years to, to really accomplish that. Yeah. Um, sure. I know we're, we're right on time to go to the next one, but I think I can take this one quick. Sure. I've heard oats is good for uh, cleaning up pythium root rot. What would you say to that? Huh, interesting. I, I, I have not heard that, but I'm open to a lot of good ideas here. So if it works, I, I hope somebody's writing a paper on that and back that up, but uh, that, that would be great. I got one more quick yeah. one. For you, Cop copper levels right here, right here. Okay, <laughs> copper levels in soil. Would you expect less uh, striped grass on wheat with higher copper levels? I, I, I again, I've heard people uh, make this statement. I haven't been involved in any research to to back that up, but cert but certainly, copper is one of those uh, minor elements that is associated with uh, with the immune system in plants. So. Uh, it, it's likely to some light, but I have no evidence. So, do you, have you seen some uh, data on that? Anecdotally, okay. Not. Yeah. Well, yeah. A good researchable you, question. Yeah. 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 When you're chopping silage, if you chop it higher, would you get less less uh, garbage in the sample? Oh boy, um, not sure of the answer to that. To be honest, while crown rust was brought up um, in the previous session, I want to point out that we are seeing a more rapid evolution of virulence in the crown rust fungal populations. So varieties that had been shown as some of our best resistant varieties for many years are all of a sudden showing up to look quite susceptible. So this is a note of caution when you look up in a book somewhere and you see an R next to a variety that these are kind of dynamic things. And, and uh, you, you need to be in touch with the people doing research on that and see how that evolves. So listen, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I welcome the, uh, the opportunity to talk to any of you with uh, individual questions. Thank you.